Okay. So, uh, a couple of things before we get started. Because today, uh, I am reading Password to Lars Berlin. And when I say today, I mean, this is recorded on, this is going to, you're going to be hearing this on Friday. So, anyway... Today's the reading stream for Password to Luxford Lane, uh, number 10 of the Nancy Drew Mystery Stories. But, as I said before that, we get into that. Uh, I would like to thank, thank for, thanks for the following. I can't even speak. Thanks for the following, Nut Lapota 1982. I am so sorry if I pronounced anything wrong. Um, since I cannot be there in current time. Uh, to be corrected. I will also like to thank Mo for the 45 bits that was cheered on Tuesday. Um, Tuesday was absolute bullcrap in trying to premiere on uh, premiere on Twitch. So if things don't work on Twitch, I'll, pr I'll premiere things on YouTube. Um, there shouldn't be any problems in scheduling because I'm I do these recordings in advance. Um, I mean I actually have to sit there and schedule the rerun, like because it doesn't. Well, I shouldn't say schedule, like click the, the start a rerun button because it doesn't allow you to schedule at all, not like YouTube does. But um, yeah, like there should be. On Sunday, Tuesday, and Friday, there should be a video. And if you don't see me uh, premiering on Twitch at 12:30 on, well, I I said on Twitch, uh, then most likely I will be at YouTube. And for those who happen to be on mobile, because I know Mo had a problem with this, so what you need to do is that you go onto my page, go to the info section, and when you look at the first, um, um, the headline, which is like some major changes, uh, I, in, in that section of that headline, there's actually a highlighted, underlined, um, two-part phrase, Scorpio Carnage, that's me, um, just click that and it'll take you to the YouTube channel, that, that's that. Um, but yeah, that's everything, so let us actually get started with Nancy Drew Mystery Stories. Um, so this week I'm reading, next week I will actually be doing, uh, Don't Start Together, I'm going to alternate between weeks. So first week, so this week, reading, next Friday will be Don't Start Together, Sunday and Tuesday will be, um will be Detective D. And another thing I will implement is that if I happen to finish Detective D on a Sunday, I'm actually going to just do Nancy Drew uh, speed runs on Tuesday. Um, because I want to actually start in a new game on a Sunday because people are more available then than they are on a Tuesday. Um, despite, you know, this whole coronavirus thing. People still follow a schedule. But anyway, um, so password to Larkspur Lane. Hopefully the recording is actually pretty good. It looks pretty good, but then I think it should be a whole lot more stable than if it was trying to do a game. But anyway, um, so anyway, password to Larkspur Lane. Here's the summary. Bluebells will be singing horses. This strange mes message attached to the leg of a wounded homing pigeon involves Nancy Drew in a dangerous mission. Somewhere, an elderly woman is being held prisoner in a mansion. Nancy is determined to find and free Mrs. Eldridge. While working on the case, the young detective's close friend, Helen Archer, because she was actually Helen Corning, but she got married, uh, begs her to solve a weird mystery. Helen's grandparents, the Hornings, are frightened by a sinister wheel of blue fire that appears after dark in the woods outside their home at Lonely Sylvan Lake. When Nancy discovers the significance of the eerie signal, she also learns that her two mysteries are connected. How the clever young detective fathoms the meaning of the strange message, how she locates the stronghold of a ruthless swing of, 
ruthless ring of swindlers and how she rescues the gang's victims makes absorbing and exciting reading. Chapter 1. Singing Horses. If, if this were 2,000 years ago, Nessie drew paws on the flagstone path of her garden in front of a border of beautiful larkspur. For a moment, the attractive titian haired girl of 18 watched the tall blue plumes waving in the breeze. Then she turned to the middle-aged woman behind her. I must select the very best for the flower show, Hannah, she said. The dresser's housekeeper and Nancy paused to look up at, an, at a passing airplane. They were startled to hear his engine cut out. As Nancy and Hannah watched in alarm, a wounded bird plummeted down and landed among the flowers. A homing pigeon, Nancy exclaimed, seeing the tiny tube, metal tube attached to its leg. Maybe the bird's carrying a message. Hannah Gruen's eyes were on the plane. Oh, Nancy, she gasped. It's going to crash. Nancy gazed upward and saw that the twin-engine craft was flying very low. The plane was tan color and had a curious design outlined in black on the fuselage. I most likely pronounced that wrong. Moving on. It looks like a winged horse, Nancy thought, but she could not be sure since the sun was shining in her eyes. Suddenly, the coughing engines roared to life and the plane nosed upward, then zoomed away. Phew! Hannah exclaimed, I thought that thing was going to fall right onto our house. I wonder if the plane hit this pigeon, Nancy said, and once more turned her attention to the bird, which was panting feebly. You poor dear, she said, picking it up. Gently, Nancy felt for broken bones, but found none. The pigeon may only be stunned, she said. What a miracle that it's alive, Hannah said. Nancy nodded. I better see if the pigeon's carrying a message. It might be something important that we ought to report to the bird's owner. While the housekeeper held the pigeon, Nancy removed the top of the capsule on its leg and slid out a thin piece of paper. She unrolled the message and read aloud, Trouble here. After five o'clock, bluebells will be singing horses. Come tonight. Nancy and Hannah looked at each other in puzzlement. It's a strange message, the housekeeper said. What in the world does that mean? I wish I knew, Nancy replied. But it sounds urgent and mysterious. She slipped the message into her pocket. I'll wire the International Federation of American Homing Pigeon Fanciers and give them the number stamped on the bird's leg ring. All homing pigeons are registered by number so the owners can be traced. Nancy conveniently noting, knowing information cliche. She examined the ring containing the digits 2-21-12-12 then hurried off to phone the telegraph office. By the time she returned, Hannah had placed the bird in a cardboard box lined with cotton. Nancy brought an eyedropper and with it gave the pigeon water. Then she put some wild bird seed in the box. Do get well, she said softly. How are pigeons trained to carry messages? Hannah asked as Nancy placed the box on a garage shelf. They have a home loft. No matter where the birds are released, they always fly back there. Do you, did you ever hear how fast they can fly? I read about some pigeons who raced from Mexico City to New York, averaging a mile a minute. Nancy glanced at her watch. I better hurry or I won't go to get to the flower show on time. She continued snipping prized larkspurs and putting them in a basket. Before all the excitement began, said Hannah, you were saying, if this were 2,000 years ago, but you didn't finish. What did you mean? Nancy smiled. I was thinking that if I had lived 2,000 years ago, I might have been a Grecian maiden. And in that case, I might be praying right now in the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. I always imagine flowers around there. Maybe Delphinium. That's another, that's another name for Larkspur. What would you be asking for, said Hannah? That my father's olive groves would bear extra well? That his vines would be loaded with grapes and his nets heavy with fish every morning? Hannah laughed heartily at the thought of her employer, Carson Drew, the well-known lawyer, picking olives or hauling in a fish-filled net. He could do it! He could totally quit his job as a lawyer <laughs> and become a fisherman <laughs> and an uh, olive farmer. While talking, Nancy and Hannah had been cutting stalks with the finest flowers and before long had a basket full. 
Nancy took it into the kitchen and carefully fashioned an exquisite arrangement in an old English vase. They happened to have an old English vase. She carried it to her convertible parked in the circular driveway. She thought, my car was a good-looking one until that horrid man ran into last week. Ruefully, she surveyed the dent. Good luck with your entry, Mrs. Gruen said. Hope it wins a prize. Hannah, you're a darling, Nancy exclaimed and kissed her. The two had deep affection for each other. The girl's mother had died when Nancy was very young, and the housekeeper had helped Mr. Drew bring up his only child. As Nancy drove across the town of River Heights, she mulled over the strange message on the homing pigeon. Was it a code? Suddenly it occurred to Nancy that the pigeon might have been released from the plane which accidentally struck it. She wondered what the reply would be from the Homing Pigeon Fanciers Association. Maybe, she thought excitedly, I stumbled upon a new mystery. By this time, she had reached the Blenheim estate on the outskirts of River Heights. The broad, tree-shadowed lawn was filled with women setting up displays for the annual charity flower show. Nancy had been assigned a spot in the greenhouse behind the mansion. As she set her large squirrel arrangement in place, the chairman came up to her. My, Nancy, your delphinium are gorgeous, Mrs. Windsor said. Thank you, Nancy replied. I just the door, Lockspur, the woman said. Such a lovely old-fashioned flower. My grandmother had them in her garden. She always had hollyhocks and bluebells, too. Bluebells. Nancy's mind leaped to the mysterious message. Could the bluebells in it mean flowers? Aloud, she said, Mrs. Windsor, I hope the judges like my flowers as much as you do. Nancy hurried back to the convertible. She was eager to get home and see if a reply to her telegram had come. To make better time, Nancy turned off the main highway onto a little traveled shortcut. As she drove down the narrow road, Nancy saw an old black sedan parked along one side. The dusty leaves of some sprawling bushes lay across the top of the automobile and hung down over the windshield and other windows. It was impossible to see inside. That's really an old-timer, Nancy thought, and wondered if anyone were in it. After she had passed the car, her eyes shifted to the rear-view mirror. Slowing up, she would studied the license plate, which was so mud-splattered that only four digits showed. 2-21-1. Nancy's interest quickened at once. These were the first four numbers on the pigeon's leg band. Was there a connection? She gave the license plate another fleeting glance and noted by the color that it was from out of state, but she could not see the identifying initials. A moment later, an oncoming car passed her. The driver raised a hand and called, Hello, Nancy. Dr. Spire, she exclaimed. The famous bone specialist, a friend of the Drew family, was often called out on local emergencies. Glancing back again, Nancy was a little surprised to see Dr. Spire pull up in back of the old sedan. Wondering if she could be of help, Nancy stopped at the side of the road and watched as the physician walked toward the parked car carrying his black bag. As he reached the sedan, a rear door swung open. Dr. Spire put one foot inside and leaned forward. With a sudden movement, he vanished into the car and it roared away. That was strange, Nancy said aloud. It seemed as if someone jerked him into the back seat. He may have been kidnapped. Dun, dun, dun! On a hunch, Nancy backed her convertible to the physician's car, then braked and leaped out. Dr. Spire had locked his car and the keys were gone. I guess he expected to be met, Nancy told herself. He probably jumped into the old sedan. But the whole thing is peculiar. When Nancy reached home, Mrs. Gruen opened the front door. It's here. Came a few minutes ago. She handed over a telegram. Nancy tore open the envelope. The wire was from the Pigeon Fancy A's Association. It read, Local representative will call. Bird not registered. Suspect trouble. Keep, me keep message secret. Another dun 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 moment. Chapter 2. A Golden Clue. Another strange message, remarked Hannah Gruen. What do you think now, Nancy? That a real mystery has dropped into my lap, Nancy grinned. In about time, I've been longing for one ever since I solved the sign of the Twisted Candles. I can't wait to tell Dad about this. Carson Drew had always been close to his daughter, and often discussed his cases with her, because she grasped the issue so clearly and quickly. Nancy reread the telegram and said to Mrs. Gruen, 
The pigeon isn't registered. That's so, it, that's so its messages can't be traced to the sender. Hannah replied, Well, it takes all kinds of folks to make a world. What's more, pigeons, planes, and telegrams aren't getting tonight's dinner ready. We're having hot biscuits and chicken, one of your father's favorites. And mine, said Nancy. Mr. Drew likes sweet pickles, too, Hannah added. I'll go down to the cellar and get a jar. Why are you telling Nancy this, Hannah? Nancy already knows. Nancy's thoughts returned to the odd message which had been attached to the pigeon's leg. She took the note from her pocket and studied it again. The words were neatly printed in black ink. For safekeeping, Nancy slipped the note and the telegram into her purse and set it on the hall table. At that moment, she heard a thumping noise and a cry from the cellar. Hannah, she called. There was no answer. Nancy dashed to the kitchen and looked down the stellar stairs. A huddled figure lay on the floor. Oh, Nancy exclaimed and ran down the steps. The housekeeper managed to sit up. I slipped, she said shakily. Oh, my back. Hannah, Nancy exclaimed anxiously. Are you badly hurt? No, the housekeeper replied. I can get up, I'm sure. Just give me a hand. Nancy put one, har one arm around Hannah and helped the woman to her feet. Mrs. Gruen stood still a few moments to catch her breath and said, I guess I didn't break anything. Thank goodness. But I'm afraid I've strained my back. I'll drive you to Dr. Spires, Nancy said, and let him examine you. With the girl's help, the housekeeper slowly climbed the stairs. I have to get dinner, Hannah announced. That can wait, Nancy said firmly. Like, seriously, you <laughs> might have, like, ruined your back. That's the last thing you need to be concerned about. We'll leave a note telling Dad where we've gone. As they drove toward the doctor's residence and office, Nancy hoped that he was back from his mysterious call. When they reached the house, Mrs. Byer told them her husband was out. Is he still in the, that case out near the Blenheim estate? Nancy asked. I passed him on my way home from the flower show. Yes, he is, but he should be home soon. She and Nancy helped Hannah to a couch in the office. Then Mrs. Spire excused herself to get dinner and asked Nancy to answer the office phone if it should ring. Twenty minutes later, it buzzed. Nancy lifted the receiver, but before she could say hello, a muffled voice asked if Dr. Spire had returned. When Nancy said no, the caller directed her to write down a message. As she wrote, a strange expression crossed her face. At the end of the message, the speaker abruptly hung up. Can I believe my eyes? Nancy wondered as she Nancy wondered as she looked at the message she had jotted down. If you say bluebells, you will get into trouble, for they are no longer used here. Bluebells again, Nancy told herself. Was Dr. Spire somehow involved in the mystery of the message attached to the pigeon's leg? Could it be more than coincidence that the numbers on the license plate of the black sedan match the first four digits on the bird's leg band? Her suspicion that the doctor had been pull, pulled forcibly into the sedan into the sedan came flooding back. Nancy was about to tell Hannah what the anonymous caller had said when brisk footsteps were heard outside the door. Dr. Spire, a lanky, balding man, strode into the office. Although he looked worried, his thin, intense face lighted with a smile. Well, Nancy, we meet again. Hiding her surprise and relief at seeing him safe, Nancy replied with a cheerful greeting. The physician turned to Hannah. Mrs. Gruen, my wife has told me of your accident. I'm sorry to hear about it. I'll take a look at you now. Fifteen min minutes later, the doctor announced that she had a sprain back. Sprained back. Rest in bed a few days. I'll write a prescription for you. In ten days, you'll be feeling like your old self. I'll see that she rests, Nancy promised. She helped Hannah to the car and settled her comfortably in the front seat. Then she excused herself and hurried back inside. The doctor was seated at his desk, gazing into space. He looked at Nancy inquiringly. I jotted down this phone message for you, Miss, she said. Is it, is it, uh, I can't speak. It is important that I ask you something about it. The doctor's lips tightened as he read the message. Does it make sense to you, Nancy asked. Yes, he said grimly. Dr. Spire turned, Dr. Spire stood up and strode across the room. Then he turned and faced Nancy. I need help in solving a strange mystery. There's nobody with whom I'd rather discuss it than you and your father. Will you help me? Of course, Nancy replied. Then will you both come back later? Nancy agreed. I'm eager to hear your story. I think the mystery may be linked to what I'm working on. 
The doctor looked amazed, but before he could ask what she meant, Mrs. Spire came to tell him that dinner was ready. Nancy quickly excused herself. When she and Hannah reached home, Carson Drew, a tall, distinguished-looking man, was eagerly waiting for them. When someone says tall and distinguished, they really mean handsome. He was sorry to hear what had happened to the housekeep housekeeper and helped her upstairs. After Mrs. Gruen was settled in bed, Nancy brought her a tray of food, then prepared dinner for her father and herself. While they ate, Nancy told him about the strange occurrences. Mr. Drew shook his head and chuckled. You attract mystery like nectar in a flower how attracts a bee, Nancy. She grinned. In this case, I'll be the blossom and hope the villain will come my way. Don't make it weird, Nancy. I'll go with you tonight, he agreed, and I'll do anything I can help. I can to help. With a twinkle in her eyes, Nancy, sa Nancy said, Then you can start clearing the table. I'll scrape the dishes and put them in the washer. Carson Drew laughed. You caught me that time, young lady. But he was Nancy's willing helper, and it did not take the father-daughter team long to tidy the kitchen. Then they set off for Dr. Spire's office. He greeted them cordially and indicated deep leather armchairs. Mr. Drew said quietly, Suppose you tell us what's worrying you, Richard. It's a strange story, the physician said. I almost can't believe it myself. This afternoon, I had a phone call saying that a patient of mine, Mrs. Manning Smith, had been in a minor car accident on Hollow Hill Road. She wanted me to meet her there and, if necessary, take her to the hospital. The caller, a man, told me to look for an old black sedan. Since I know Mrs. Smith has one, I thought nothing of it. After passing you on the road, Nancy, I spotted the car, parked, and went up to it. Black door swung open. As I leaned forward to look inside, my shoulders were seized and I was yanked to the floor. Before I could move, a hood was dropped over my head and a man on each side held me firmly. How, f how far did you ride, Nancy asked. A long time. About an hour. Not a word was spoken during the trip. Where did they take you, Mr. Drew asked. I don't know, but some of the roads were bumpy. I think we were out in the country. When the hood was finally removed, I found myself in what appeared to be a regular hospital room. Was there a patient? Nancy asked eagerly. Yes, but not Mrs. Smith. Someone explained a clerk had made a mistake. I didn't learn the patient's name. She was an elderly woman suffering from a dislocated shoulder. There was just one other person in the room. A nurse. She was a large, hard-faced woman and warned me not to talk to the patient. Did you try? Mr. Drew queried. No, but all the time I was working, it seemed as if she wanted to tell me something. Her eyes kept flushing signals which I could not understand. Then while I was taking her pulse, the nurse turned for a moment and the woman slipped this into my hand. Dr. Spire reached into his pocket and held out a thin gold chain bracelet with a small gold shield dangling from it. How dainty, Nancy exclaimed as she took the bracelet to examine it. She said into the bangle was a garnet. There's an inscription over the jewel, she said. To my darling Mary from Joe, Nancy turned the shield over. On the other side is a coat of arms. Perhaps we could trace it and find out the woman's name. If she's being held against her will, we ought to rescue her. It's worth a try, her father agreed. Keep the bracelet, Nancy, the doctor said, and see what you can learn about it. Then he continued his story. When I finished, two men came in and replaced the hood. Then I was driven back to my car. A couple of times when I tried to resist, they got rough. How dreadful, Nancy burst out. Dr. Spire, do you think the woman was able to talk but had been ordered not to? Yes, I do. Did you see or hear anything that would help us find the place? Dr. Spire smiled. I learned the password to the place. Marvelous, said Nancy. What was it? He replied, as we turned into a driveway, I could tell by the creak of gates. The driver said, bluebells, and someone answered, pass. Nancy's eyes sparkled with excitement. This is where my story comes in, Dr. Spire. Quickly, she told him about the pigeon, the plane, and the telegram. Whoever is holding the woman prisoner must have been afraid he had heard the password, so he decided to change it. Yes, that would have been just about five o'clock, as the pigeon, pigeon message said. The physician agreed. The phone call here was to warn me not to try finding the place again or using the password to get in if I did. Carson Drew spoke up. Richard, you must report this to the police. Just then the, then the telephone rang. When the physician finished the call, he said, Emergency at the hospital. I'll have to go. Carson, will you and Nancy report the incident to the police for me? We'll stop at headquarters, the lawyer, lawyer replied. As the Drews left the house, Nancy noticed a shadowy figure across the street. Are we being watched? The young sleuth wondered. 
While driving downtown, Nancy noted a pair of headlights reflected in her mirror. One was dimmer than the other. The uneven lights stayed close behind all the way to the police pet headquarters. Nancy slowed down in front of the building and the car, a black, sleek black sedan, went past. No place to park here, Dad, she said. Suppose you hop out and start telling your story. I'll join you as soon as I find a parking space. Mr. Drew got out, and a few minutes later, Nancy pulled him to the far side of a parking lot at the corner. When she stepped out of the car, a hulking figure emerged from the nearby shadows. A feeling of apprehension swept over Nancy, and she tried to dart past the man. But a powerful hand seized her arm and jerked her back. Not so fast, the stranger growled in a deep voice. Dun, dun, dun! Chapter 3, A Chase Let me go or scream, Nancy cried out. Instantly, the man released her arm, but he swiftly stepped in front of her. Wait a minute, he commanded. You want me? You want to help your father, don't you? I don't know what you're talking about, Nancy said warily. She studied the husky, broad-shouldered man. He had heavy brows, deep-set deep eyes, and a cruel mouth. When they have a cruel anything, they're a bad guy. <laughs> Lesson to be learned in a Nancy Drew story. You're Nancy Drew, aren't you? Nancy hesitated, afraid he might be trying to find her father to harm him. Are you sure you're talking to the right person? She asked. Okay, the man said bitterly. Play it smart. It's been years since I saw Drew, and maybe I'm wrong. But I could be right, so you take a message. Nancy did not reply, and the stranger went on. Tell Carson Drew to mind his own business, or he's in for a bad shock. If you're through, Nancy said coldly, I'll go now. The man stepped aside and she hurried from the parking lot, her heart pounding. As she reached the sidewalk, Nancy came face to face with two friends. Why, Nancy Drew, exclaimed Jean Moss. I hadn't seen you in weeks. Her escort, Bill Wright, added, been solving any mysteries lately? Darn it. <laughs> she was so close. She was so freaking close. <laughs> Ah, oh, she got outed. Thanks. Thanks, random friends that will never be seen again. Maybe they'll be seen again in the story, but they will never be seen again in the future. Nancy's heart sank. Had the man in the parking lot heard them? She managed to tell pleasantly, talk pleasantly with the couple for a few minutes, but she was worried. As Jean and Bill moved off, Nancy heard a soft laugh from the shadows. A moment later, a deep voice said mockingly, Good night, Miss Drew. The speaker melted into the darkness. Darn it, <laughs> he heard. Biting her lip in vex vexation, Nancy ran to police headquarters. The officer on duty directed her to the detective bureau. Here, Mr. Drew was conferring with Lieutenant Mulligan, a red-faced, brawny man with thinning hair. He knew the Drews only by reputation. Once again, Nancy told her story. The de de ah, I can't speak. The detective jotted down the partial license number of the suspicious car. When Nancy handed him the bracelet, he said, hmm, as an description, but it's old. Mary and Joe have been dead for years. No last name or dates either. Afraid it won't be much use to us. If you don't mind, Nancy said, I'd like to see if I can trace the owner. Go ahead, the lieutenant said and gave it back. We'll check out the car's license number, but probably the kidnappers are, kidnappers are using funny plates. I mean, if they're good at what they're doing, they should be using funny plates. Not that anybody should be a kidnapper. Um, as Nancy and her father walked to the parking lot, she told him about the stranger who had accosted her there and the warning message. Mr. Drew frowned. I don't know who, who he could be. Some crank, I suppose. Cars were closely parked on either side of Nancy's convertible, so she gave her full attention to pulling out of the tight space. Soon after she had driven to the street and turned toward home, headlights appeared in her mirror. The right one was dim. Dad, the same car that followed us before is behind us, Nancy said tensely. I'm afraid the driver's the man who wants to harm you. Let's try to shake him. Keeping within the speed limit, Nancy drove into the residential section of the city, taking every cutoff and winding street she knew. Ooh, excuse me. Ooh, excuse me. That burp. Meanwhile, Mr. Drew watched the car behind, which con which continued to follow. It seems useless to try getting away, he said finally. I'd like to get a good look at the driver. 
All right, Nancy replied. She increased her speed, widening the, widening the distance between the two cars until she approached an intersection where there was a there was a bright overhead light. She swung around her tires, squealing on the asphalt, and stopped short for, facing her pursuer. When he became abreast of them, Carson drew gasped. Trail him! The lawyer ordered as the driver zoomed off. Okay, that was a weird way to say it. Like, gasped had a period, and then it was like, trail him. But whatever, we'll move on. Nancy turned again and pursued the sedan. Just as she was about to overtake it, the traffic light ahead turned red. The driver rode straight through, rounded a corner, and disappeared. Nancy sighed. We'll never find him now. Never mind, Mr. Drew. It was a good try. Let's go home. Who was that man, Dad? Nancy asked. Adam Thorne, an escaped convict. Thank goodness he didn't hurt you. Nancy shuddered. What was he jailed for? Thorne was given ten years for embezzling the assets of an estate. While in jail, he became very bitter and at times violent. But what's his interest in you? Nancy queried. Mr. Drew explained that Thorne had been a River Heights attorney. He was disbarred prior to his trial, trial and I was in charge of gathering the evidence against him. I see, said Nancy. Said Nancy. Dad, I have a hunch Adam Thorne is involved in the Bluebell mystery. He must have been spying outside Dr. Spire's house and recognized you. Probably he's not only looking for revenge, but wants to keep us from working on the case. I'm afraid you're right. For Pete's sake, be careful, Nancy. You too, Dad. A few minutes later, the Drews reached home. While Nancy checked on Hannah, who was asleep, Mr. Drew called Lieutenant Mulligan and reported his daughter's encounter with Adam Thorne and the resultant unsuccessful chase. Thorne's tied in with Dr. Spire's kidnapping, said Mulligan. He'll stop at nothing. I'll broadcast a bulletin immediately. The next morning, Nancy was up early and went, up, went to talk to Hannah Gruen. I have good news for you, the housekeeper said. My niece, niece Effie has offered to come here and work while I'm laid up. Good. Effie's fun. And scatterbrained sometimes, Hannah remarked. <laughs> Excuse me. After breakfast, Nancy drove off to get Effie Schneider. When she rang the bell of the small framed cottage, the door was opened by Effie's mother. Hello, Mrs. Schneider, said Nancy. How are you? Fine, thanks. Please come in. Effie isn't undressed yet. She's been reading a movie magazine instead of putting on her clothes. Effie, she called. Here I am, Mom, a high-pitched voice replied. Hi, Nancy, said the girl as she walked into the living room munching a banana. Hello, Effie, Nancy greeted the thin 17-year-old girl. Effie had light blonde hair, which she wore close-cropped with feathery bangs over her forehead. She was dressed in a Chinese-style Chinese pink kimono with high-heeled satin mules. This outfit is like the one Ling Su wore in the movie The Chinese Wall Mystery, Effie remarked, making an oriental bow. Nancy grinned, but Mrs. Schneider said tartly, Hurry up and put on street clothes, Effie. As her daughter went off, Mrs. Schneider turned to Nancy. Once Effie stops mooning about movie stars and singers, she's really a good worker and a dandy cook. Nancy, Nancy had her doubts about this, but later was agreeably surprised when Effie prepared a delicious luncheon of chicken salad, hot rolls, and iced tea. She would not let Nancy help her. Aunt Hannah told me you're working on a mystery, Effie said. That's exciting! You keep your mind on the case. I'll do the work around the house. I once read a mystery about a circus girl who shot out of a cannon and disappeared. It took three detectives a whole month to find her, but you bet you can't guess where. Nancy grinned. Inside the cannon? Oh, gee, how'd you know? Effie said. You must have read the story. No, I didn't. Bewildered, Effie shook her head and walked off. After eating lunch, Nancy decided to start tracing the owner of the bracelet. Half an hour later, she walked into Butler and Stone's jewelry store and asked for Mr. Stone, who was a personal friend. Well, Nancy, what can I do for you? The jeweler asked cordially. Are you interested in a diamond-studded detective badge today? He teased. Nancy laughed. Do you sell them? She countered. Oh, sure. To the police, the jeweler replied with a grin. Nancy took the bracelet from her purse. Mr. Stone, could you trace this coat of arms? The jeweler held the bracelet toward the window to get a better look at the heraldic design on the shield. As he did, Nancy noticed a large woman in a pink butterfly print dress looking through the plate glass window. Just a moment, Nancy said quickly to Mr. Stone. Is there some other place? The jeweler understood at once. Another mystery, he asked. 
When Nancy nodded, he motioned to a private office at the back of the store. Once again, Mr. Stone examined the bracelet. This was made in Victorian times, he announced. I doubt if it was designed around here. Hmm, an attractive coat of arms. Three mullets de dexter and a Maltese cross sinister. Crest, a falcon's head embattled with the motto Esse quam videi. Every authentic coat of arms is a matter of record, Mr. Stone explained. It will take time, but we will be able to trace the family, if not the individual owner. May I keep the bracelet temporarily? Nancy hesitated. It doesn't belong to me, she said. Could you make a copy of the crest? Certainly. Please take a seat. Mr. Stone excused himself and went out. In 15 minutes, he returned, gave the bracelet to Nancy, and said he would send the tracing to Mr. Abelard de Gotha, an expert on coat of arms. Thank you. I'll stop by in a couple of days to see if you heard about it, Nancy said. As the young detective left the store, her thoughts turned to the sick woman who had given the bracelet to Dr. Spire. I wonder who she is. Poor thing. At the corner, Nancy waited with a group of people for the light to change. As the walk signal came on, someone pushed roughly past her and darted out into the street. Nancy recognized the pink butterfly print dress and at the same moment realized that her arm felt strangely light. My handbag, Nancy gasped. It's gone. The woman was hurrying ahead of the crowd. Nancy was sure she had stolen the bag and sprinted after her. Stop, Nancy shouted, but the woman broke into a run. Nancy put on a spurt of speed and caught up to her on the far sidewalk. Give me back my... The big woman whirled and gave Nancy a powerful push that sent her reeling. She fell backward off the curb. Just rude, not Dan. Um, for those who are not familiar, in the Nancy Drew group that I'm in, we say rude, not Dan, referring to one of the Nancy Drew games, um, Danger by Design. And in it, there's a character who says... Uh, the word rude as in to me cool. So when I say rude not Dan, it's basically saying rude. <laughs> it's just being extra and saying rude. But anyway, chapter four. Frightened grandparents. Several quick acting pedestrians caught Nancy just before, just before she hit the pavement. Are you hurt? exclaimed a middle-aged woman as she helped the girl to her feet. I saw that awful woman push you. Were you trying to catch her? Nancy took a deep breath and said, Yes, she stole my purse. Then, then added, I'm all right. Thanks so much. Suddenly, Nancy spotted the thief hurrying into Brent's department store down the street. She dashed after her and hacked him through the revolving doors. Looking around quickly, Nancy saw a flash of pink near the pink of elevators. By the time she reached them, the woman had gone up in one of the cars. Nancy darted to the nearby escalator and brushed up two steps at a time. On the second floor, she sped to the elevators, but, but saw by the indicated light that the car she wanted had already left. The woman was not in sight. What luck, Nancy murmured, darting back to the escalator. A few moments later, she arrived breathless on the third floor. As Nancy looked toward the elevator, the door was starting to close. No one was inside. The woman she was after must have stepped off here. May I help you? asked the sales girl. We have some lovely... No, no, Nancy panted. I'm after a thief. A woman in a pimp, pink, print, pink print dress. Did you see her get off the elevator? The girl's eyes grew wide. A thief, she exclaimed. Why, yes, I did see her, but I don't know where she went. What did she take? My purse, said Nancy. I'll get my supervisor, said the sales girl. Nancy glanced around the third floor where many customers were examining racks of dresses. Where could the woman be hiding? Dressing rooms, Nancy decided. She saw that the fall, clo fall clothes department had fewer customers than the others. I'll start there. She hadn't hastened across the floor and peered through an archway into a narrow aisle. There was a row of curtained cubicles along one wall. Along one wall. Quietly, Nancy peeked into the first room. Empty. In the next, a stout woman was struggling into a tight dress. She did not see Nancy. Quickly, the young detective moved along the row of dressing rooms. In the fifth room, she found a thief. The woman was leaning against the wall, panting. Nancy's open handbag lay on a shelf beside her, and in one hand, the woman clutched the gold chain bracelet. I'll take that, Nancy said, stepping into the cubicle. The woman froze in amazement for a moment, then swiftly seized the handbag and hurled it at Nancy. As the girl ducked, the contents scattered, and the woman tried to dash past. Nancy seized her wrist and caught hold of the bracelet. Help! Thief! she shouted. 
Instantly, the woman let go of the gold chain, broke free, and raced into the corridor with Nancy at her heels. The thief darted through the arch, but as Nancy reached it, two salesmen arrived, blocking the way. What happened? one asked. The woman in, that woman in pink, Nancy exclaimed. I must stop her! She darted around the sales ladies and ran toward the elevators. Too late! She saw the thief board a car just before the door closed. How to stop her? Suddenly, Nancy spotted a store telephone behind a nearby counter. She hurried to it and picked up the receiver. Operator, this is an emergency. Ring the phone nearest the entrance on Main Street, please. And a second, a voice said, Silverware. Listen carefully, Nancy said tersely. A large woman in a pink print dress will probably come rushing toward you any minute now, heading for the door. Stop her! She's a thief! Just a moment, said the clerk. There was a pause and the speaker said, The woman you described passed my counter after we were talking. I ran after her, but she hopped into a taxi and it sped off. Shall I notify the store detective? No, thanks, said Nancy. It's too late. Disappointed, she hung up as a voice behind her said, What's going on? Nancy turned around. It was Mr. Mahoney, the store manager. He was surrounded by sales ladies. One gave Nancy her handbag with all the contents restored. Oh, hello, Nancy, said Mr. Mahoney. What's this about a thief in the store? Nancy took him aside and explained briefly, I don't think the woman is an ordinary purse snatcher. She's probably mixed up in a case I'm working on. Well, I hope you catch her, Mr. Mahoney said. He waved goodbye and walked off. Well, that's that. Like, no, how are you doing? Are you feeling okay? Nothing? Thanks, dude. Nancy exam examined her handbag. The strap had been cut. I doubt if that woman knew I had the bracelet with me before she saw it through the jeweler's window. The young detective suspected that Adam Thorne had engaged the thief to trail her. I believe she recognized the bracelet, Nancy told herself, and she'll tell Thorne about it. I hope the old lady who owns it doesn't get into trouble for slipping it to Dr. Spire. Deep in thought, as she walked down the street, Nancy did not see a petite, dark-haired young woman hurrying toward her. Nancy, we'd love to run into you. Helen Corning! Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy said with a grin. I can't get used to your being Mrs. Archer. How's everything? Oh, just great, except for one thing. Nancy, I was going to call you this very afternoon. How about solving a mystery for me? Seeing her friend's look of interest, she chuckled. I thought that would catch you. Could you come to my apartment tomorrow evening at 6? I'll tell you all about it then. Besides, Jim would love to see you. I wouldn't miss it, Nancy replied. But I think it's only fair to tell you I'm already working on a mystery. Helen smiled. Then this is just one more. You're so clever, Nancy. I'm sure you can solve both at once. Nancy laughed. Give me a hint. Helen explained that her grandmother and grandfather Corning had recently moved to Sylvan Lake. They have a dreamy stone house on a hill. It is beautiful. But now Graham and Gramp are afraid to stay there because of something queer that keeps happening. What is it? Nancy asked. Helen glanced at her watch. I'd love to tell you, but I must run. See you tomorrow. We'll drive out to the lake and have dinner with Grandma and Gramp. Thanks a million, Nancy. As Helen Archer hurried away, Nancy stood on the sidewalk, musing, Hmm, another case. Then she turned toward home. When Nancy reached it, Effie opened the front door. I heard you drive in, she said in a loud whisper. The pigeon man's here, she gestured toward the living room. He's very good looking. Thank you, said Nancy, and went to greet the caller, hoping he had not heard Effie. A tall, blonde man in his twenties got up as she entered. He introduced himself as Donald Jordan, secretary of the local branch of the Pigeon Fanciers Association. He showed her his credentials. I'm so glad you came, said Nancy. Please sit down. I'll get the pigeon and the message. Nancy hurried to the garage and saw with relief that the bird seemed stronger. Oh, I hope Mr. Jordan won't take you away, she murmured to the bird. I want you to get well enough to fly to your home loft. Then I'll follow you. You know, you did say that the bird drives on a bird drives. <laughs> now I'm just imagining this pigeon in a car <laughs> driving through the air. But no, this pigeon fly like the pigeon can fly a mile a minute, according to you, Nancy. Um, how are you gonna follow this? Nancy carried the pigeon to the living room. Mr. Jordan examined the bird gently, noting especially the number on a flag man. Then Nancy took the message from her purse and handed it to him. This is the second pit this is the second pigeon seen in this area with an unregistered number, he said. The other was found dead on the highway. 
I mentioned it to a detective friend of mine. He thought criminals might be using this means of communication, thinking it's safer than telephone or telegraph or letter. Nancy nodded and told him she had reported the incident to the police. Good. Not saves us the trouble, the young man rose. Well, thank you for notifying me, Miss Drew. Now I'll take the burden. Oh, please don't, Nancy exclaimed. Mr. Jordan looked surprised. Surely you don't want to be bothered with the sick pigeon. I don't mind, said Nancy. I'd like to try to nurse it back to health. The young man shook his head. I'm afraid there's not much, chan not much chance. But if that's what you want, it's okay with me. He made copies of the leg band number and the strange message, then wished her luck and left. Nancy returned the pigeon to the garage. She immediately went to Hannah Grimm's room to tell her about the latest developments in the case. In about time, said the housekeeper. I never hear any news up here. How are you feeling, Nancy asked. Much better. If it wasn't for that fussy doctor, I'd be up and working like I should. Nancy laughed. You just take it easy while you have the chance. Late in the afternoon, Mr. Drew called to say that he could not be home until 9 o'clock. To keep Hannah company, Nancy and Effie ate supper on trays in her room and afterward watched a television play. At the end, Effie sniffed in disappointment. Not enough love, she commented. Now that handsome Mistress Kyle should have. She stopped speaking as the front doorbell rang. Dad must have forgot his key, Nancy remarked. I'll go. She hurried down the stairs and started to open the door. Instinct told the young sleuth to be cautious. She flicked the wall switch to turn on the porch light and opened the door a crack. The porch was dark. Nancy thought the bulb must have burned out. Dad? Nancy called quickly. There was no answer, but from somewhere in the shadows came the sound of heavy breathing. Ooh, heavy breathing. Okay, so I have only 46 minutes left, so this should be the last chapter. No, probably not. I'll probably, uh, I'll get to chapter six. Get to... I'm only reading for an hour. But anyway, chapter five, Blue Fire. Who's there? Nancy called sharply into the darkness. She heard a stirring near the porch, but could see no one. Never mind, ooh, came a rasping whisper from the shadows. We warned your father to mind his own business. Now we're telling you, forget the doctor's story or you'll be sorry. Just then, headlights swept up the driveway. Instantly, a dark figure dashed across the lawn and disappeared into the night. Nancy recognized her father's car. Moments later, Mr. Drew parked beside the house and hurried up the porch steps. Is something wrong? he asked. Why are you out here? A man rang the bell, Dad, but wouldn't let me see him. He gave us another warning. The lawyer's face was grim. Did you recognize his voice? he asked. It sounded something like Adam Thorne's, Nancy replied. I can't be sure because he spoke in a whisper. The man was big, though, like Thorn. Nancy explained the, why the light was not on and tried to turn to examine it. The bulb's gone, she exclaimed. I suppose the man took it out so I couldn't see him. I'll put in a new one. I'd like to wring that fellow's neck, her father stormed. I'll put the car away, then report this to Lieutenant Milligan. Dad, before you put the car in the garage, would you drive me to the flower show? I'm just a little bit caught curious as, as to who won the prizes. He grinned. Of course I'll take you. He patted her shoulder. While I phone Mulligan, go tell Hannah and Effie where we're going and not to answer the doorbell. Twenty minutes later, father and daughter arrived at the greenhouse on the Blenheim estate. The display was beautiful, but the cut flowers were beginning to wilt. Nancy's pulse quickened as she approached her own entry. Dad, she cried out, look! Attached to her blue bouquet larkspur was a dark blue satin ribbon with the inscription, First Prize! Nancy, that's wonderful, her father said. Congratulations. Maybe you ought to give up solving mysteries and raise flowers. Not a chance, she said. But it's far less dangerous, he countered. Take this present mystery, for instance. It might be wise for you to drop it. Nancy looked shocked. I don't blame her. What? <laughs> Carson, Drew, what? You're now concerned about your daughter being in danger on a mystery? Well, he, he always been, but he was always like, Nancy, be cautious. But he's, uh, is this the, I don't remember, is this the first time that he actually tells Nancy to, like, hey, Nancy, drop the case? But yeah. What? No! Carson! No! Carson! No! Nancy looked shocked. Why, Dad? Think of the poor old woman who's a prisoner. But Nancy, my first concern is for your safety. 
You are more important to me than all the mysterious old, lady, mysterious old ladies in the world. Well, that is both flattering and disappointing. Nessie's face showed her disappointment. Oh, please, Dad, no. Mr. Drew looked uncomfortable. I know, I know. You're like me. You'll never be satisfied until you lick the problem. Go ahead. Thank you, Dad, Nancy said happily. I will. Hold it, Miss Drew, said a voice nearby. Nancy looked up to see a news photographer pointing a camera at her. There, stand right next to your exhibit. Before she could comply, Nancy heard another voice say, Go get her! And that's at the same instant, a big, vicious-looking dog sprang at her. Oh, she screamed, dodging just in time. The Great Dane crashed into the vase of prized flowers, knocking the exhibit to the ground and shattering the vase. He yelped in fright and ran off. Who owns that beast? cried the photographer. No one claimed to be the owner. The Druze guessed Thorn was behind the attack, but could see him nowhere in the crowd. He, or his henchman, had taken advantage of the excitement to escape. Okay, that picture is not that of a Great Dane. That does not look like a Great Dane to me. You can't see it, but there's like, um, there's illustrations. This dog does not look like a, a Great Dane. <laughs> it looks like the, it looks like, um, um, a mix of different dogs. So I, I don't know. But anyway, moving on. Nancy reported the incident to Mrs. Oh, wait. Did I miss a line? He or his henchman had taken advantage of the excitement to escape. Okay, moving on. Nancy reported the incident to Mrs. Windsor, who told her to take the blue ribbon home. When she and her father reached the house, Hannah and Effie were delighted to hear that Nancy had won first prize in, in, first prize in the Delphil, Delphinium class. Here's hoping, said Mrs. Gruen, that you'll come out ahead in your mystery, too. Here's sweet, Nancy told the housekeeper. Then kissed her good night without telling of the without telling of the dog episode. That was a weird that was a weird sentence. But she was alarmed over it. Nancy went to her pretty yellow and white bedroom. There she changed into pajamas, robe, and slippers, and seated herself at her desk. She was determined to figure out the strange message which which the pigeon had been carrying. She opened a gardening book and turned to bluebells and delphinium and larkspur. She learned that bluebells were different from the others. Delphinium were perennial flowers and usually blue, though some were white or lavender. Larkspur, the annual flower of the genus, occurred in pale and dark blue, mauve, and other shades. In common usage, however, the names Delphinium and Larkspur were often interchanged. Well, that's interesting, Nancy thought, but it doesn't get me much further. She closed the book with a sigh and put it away. Maybe if I just forget the whole thing until morning, an answer will come to me. She stretched on, out on her comfortable bed and turned in the, the clock radio to her favorite musical program, but her mind kept returning to the problem. I have Larkspur on the brain. Larkspur, Larkspur, she mused, clasping her head, hands behind her head. Funny name. I wonder how they came to be called that. Maybe because the blossoms have little points or spurs? But why the lark? Why not a sparrow spur or ostrich spur? Spurs are for horses, and horses don't look like larks, and larks don't suggest anything that wears spurs. Larks sing an- Oh! Nancy said, bold up, this hat, bold up, right? I have it! I'll bet that's it! She raced to her father's study and knocked. Mr. Drew called, Come in. He looked up from the letter he was writing when Nancy exclaimed, Dad, I think I have a clue to the kidnapper's hideout! It's Larkspur! Singing horses stands for Larkspurs! Nancy, that could be it. Maybe the kidnappers got the idea of using that flower in their code because it grows at the headquarters of the gang. The lawyer nodded thoughtfully as Nancy went on. There may be bluebells there too, but I'm not sure. Bluebells and Pigeon's message might mean something else since it is two words. I'm going to drive through, 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 I can't speak, drive through the countryside until I find a place, a house, a street, or something else that has large spurs, bluebells, or bolts as its most common, as its most conspicuous feature. It's certainly a lead worth taking on, worth working on, said her father. Better than trying to follow the pigeon to its home loft. Far better than trying to find the, follow the pigeon to its home loft. In the morning, Nancy studied a map of the River Heights area and decided to ride through the countryside east of the town on her search for the telltale flowers. She drove tirelessly, stopping only to ask people if they could direct her to places where either larkspurs or bluebells grew. 
Here and there, she found larkspurs in gardens or private homes too small to be the place Dr. Spire had described. After lunch, she drove on, but had no luck. At four o'clock, she gave up, disappointed. My score is exactly zero, she thought. Well, tonight I'll hear about the corny mystery. Back home again, Nancy went to Hannah, uh, Hangruen's room, to see how the housekeeper was getting along. I'm feeling much better, Hannah reported, and told Nancy that her father would not be home for supper. Nancy showered, put on a pretty lime green dress with a matching sweater, and left the house. Twenty minutes later, she was ringing the bell of Helen's apartment. The door is opened by Helen's handsome husband, Jim Archer. Hi, Nancy, he said, smiling. We're ready. Jim will drive his, his car out to the lake, Helen said as she came into the living room. Leave yours here. On the way, Helen asked about Nancy's two close girlfriends, Bess Marvin and her cousin, George Fane. How are they? They've been vacationing in California, said Nancy, but they're coming home tomorrow. She chuckled. Won't they be surprised when I tell them I have two mysteries they can help me solve? Helen grinned. It's my guess they won't be a bit surprised. Presently, Jim turned onto the side road, which led to the lake. When they reached it, the setting sun had turned the water to a golden color. A few sailboats silhouetted against the red sky were heading toward shore. What a lovely scene, Nancy exclaimed. The road circled the lake and at one point branched onto a drive which led up the wooded, the, uh, words, which led up the wooded hill, hillside. Hillside! Hillside! <sighs> anyway. The Corning's modern house was nestled among the trees and rocks at the top, overlooking the water. The drive went wound around it into a large, flagstoned area surrounded by shrubs. Jim parked the car there. The front door is in the back, Helen said with a laugh as she led the way to it and rang the, and rang the bell. The door was opened by a middle-aged housekeeper with red hair. He wore neat, neat dark trousers and a white jacket. Wore neat, dark trousers and a white jacket. Hello, Morgan, Helen said cheerfully. How are you? All right, thank you, he answered, but did not smile. Nancy wondered if he, too, was worried about the strange happenings here. Mrs. Corning hurried into the, into the hall to greet her guests. She was a pretty woman with short, fluffy white hair and just as petite as Helen. She took them into the big living room with a huge picture window. Mr. Corning rose from a chair. He was a tall man with a bold, ar aristocratic nose. Though he, had used to, though he had to use a can to support his frail-looking body, his dark eyes were alert and usually sparkled with humor. But now, Nancy noted there was a strange expression on his, on his face. What is frightening the Cornings? Nancy wondered. She had no hint until after dinner, when the group returned to the living room. As the girls seated themselves in deep pumpkin-colored pumpkin chairs. Hmm... I don't like that color. Pumpkin colored. Pumpkin colored. I guess it can work depending on the room, the color of the room, but it's like, otherwise that might stand out. But anyway, Mrs. Corning went to the picture window. She began to draw the soft beige, soft beige draperies, shutting out the dark wooded hillside below and the few lights of houses on the opposite shore. Oh, please leave the curtains open, Graham, said Helen. Let's watch for, the thing, watch for the thing tonight. After all, that's what Nancy's here for. Thing? Nancy repeated, leaning forward in her chair. Please, tell me about it. Of course, said Mr. Corning. As his wife opened the curtains again, he began, One night, about two weeks ago, my wife and I were sitting here enjoying the view when we saw a large circle of blue fire at the bottom of the hill. Blue fire, Nancy exclaimed. Mr. Corning nodded. Yes, it's a circle about as big as a car wheel and glows with an eerie blue fire. It's approximately seven feet off the ground. Sounds weird, Helen remarked. How long did it last? Nancy asked. About five minutes, then vanished. The next night it came again, this time closer. We've seen the thing every night since, put in Mrs. Corning. It has come nearer each time. Somehow I feel it as a threat. In the meantime, her husband went on, there have been strange happenings in the house. I want to show you something. He rose unsteadily, then suddenly gasped. Seizing the chair back with one hand, he pointed with his cane out the huge window. There's! Uh, there's that spooky blue flame again! Nancy leaped to her feet. In the darkness of the woods, not far below the house, glowed a large blue fiery circle. Helen! Jim! Nancy exclaimed. Let's go see what it is! 
Be careful, Mrs. Corning urged as the young people dashed from the room. The trio let themselves out the main door. Helen and I will go to the right, Missy whispered. Jim, you take the left. When we're even with the light, let's get close it let's close in on it. As Jim slipped away in the darkness, the girls went quietly down through the woods. The blue circle continued to burn steadily. Queer, Nancy murmured. What is it? Unfortunately, Helen slipped on a stone and turned her ankle. Involuntarily, she gave a cry of pain. Darn it, Helen! <laughs> Both girls froze, their hearts pounding. For a moment, the circle of light did not move. Then slowly, it began to turn toward them. Dun, dun, dun! And we're going to end that here. So that has been an hour with Nancy Drew. Um, we've gotten through five chapters. There are 20 chapters in this book. So this is actually going to take four reading sessions. Four reading sessions. Um, yeah, Nancy's been through a lot so far in this book. She's had a purse stolen, been pushed off a curb, been threatened multiple times, and including being threatened by a dog. Um, thankfully, the dog got scared because <laughs> he bumped into the table and made things crash, and he's like, ah, ah. Dogs do really hate things falling. Um, but anyway, I, I'm going to end this video here. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. On Sunday, uh, on Twitch, I'm going to be doing more Detective D. This will be the third part, third video, um, and it'll be, it'll consist of, um, chapter one, uh, and the first two iterations of Detective D, I, is it is iteration or right word? I think iteration is the right word. Uh, but anyway, first two videos of the effect of D, I was just finishing finishing up the prologue. I will have to redo um, chapter, uh, not chapter, redo pro the first part of the prologue um, because there's a lot of audio skipping. But um, yeah, so Sunday shall be some more Detective D. And we finally get to the main part of the story. Woo! But anyway, see you wonderful people on Sunday!